every time you can get even just the slightest bit of trust that you can get connected with and really feel between you and your kid, that grows exponentially. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode number 252. Today, we're talking about simpler, more natural parenting with Rachel Rainbolt. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast, now with over a million downloads. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have, and when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clarkfield's Mindful Mama mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting course and membership, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back to the Mindful Mama podcast, my friend. I hope you're doing okay out there. It's a crazy world. So many people are suffering. It's hard. Even if you have a lot of comfort and you know it's hard it's hard mentally to to be away from friends and and winter and all of those things so I'm just want to say that I'm thinking about you dear listener and I hope that you are doing well and I hope that together we can focus on positive changes that are in our power to make right so welcome welcome if you're brand new of course welcome to the podcast I am so glad you're here in just a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Rachel Rainbolt, and yes, that's her real name, <laughs> as you'll hear me say. She is the Sage Family Coach. She's a writer and podcaster and advocate of gentle parenting, natural homeschooling, and simple living, and she has an MA in marriage and family therapy and decades of experience guiding families to peace and joy. So we're going to be talking about simpler, more natural living. It's a conversation that sort of runs a gambit of various topics. And, you know, we're in this more tech, more stuff. Like my husband just got us a VR set, (laughs) virtual reality set. And it's like so weird. I don't know. For me, it's a little, uh, you know, and so we need kind of an antidote to that, I think, right? Like we need to be tapping into simplicity and ease and nature to give us a sense of rest and ease. So how do we get there, right? How do we get there if we have this busy life? And that's what we talk about today. And and Rachel helps us to kind of move from overwhelmed to calm, you know, from, from fearful to trusting, which is really beautiful. We talk about how kids absorb their environment and reflect it back in their behavior. Environment really matters. And how when we have the intention to join with our child, we can get out of the house more easily. So really listen for that. That'll be a a helpful mindset shift for you. And how we need to pull together our intuition with science and research. So you'll hear Rachel speaks my language, a believer in science and simplicity. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. And uh, just before we dive in, I want to let you know that the only thing that's happening now in in this mindful mama world that I got to let you know about is that I am only offering one round of the mindful parenting teacher certification course. And it is if you want to become a certified mindful parenting teacher in your local community. And it may be for you if you are a therapist or maybe a teacher of kids already, you may have some child education knowledge. So this may be for you and it'll teach you to teach mindful parenting in your local community, like I said. And I only take a few people, very small group into this teacher training. This will be for 2021 and we only accept about 50% of applicants. But if you think for you, go to mindfulparentingcourse.com slash teach, and you can learn all about it, the different things it involves. You can be anywhere in the world. We have teacher trainers right now who are everywhere from Australia to England to the US. We've had teacher trainers in Sweden. So go to mindfulparentingcourse.com slash teach, learn about it, and you'll see a button there where you can schedule a call and then we'll chat on the phone and see if it's the right fit for you. And then if it is, we'll send you a link to fill out that application and join. So that's mindfulparentingcourse.com slash teach. 
Okay. I think that's all I have to announce. We have some, I guess I'll also announce that we have some awesome sponsors. They are so great. Supporting the sponsors, great way to support the podcast. We love, love, love partnering with them and they're really making it possible to get everything rolling and behind the scenes here. So great way to support the podcast. And um, I think that's all I want to say. Let's dive in and join me with this conversation with Rachel Rainbolt. Rachel, thanks so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And I'm happy to talk to you too. And dear listener, I just have to tell you that Rainbow is Rachel's real last name. (laughs) It was the first thing I asked her off the air. I was like, really? Is it really? It's true. I met my husband and I said, you know, I'm a feminist and I'm going to keep my last name. (laughs) And then he was like, oh, that's cool. My last name is Rainbow. I was like, oh. (laughs) (laughs) No, I let all that go and took his last name because I just loved it so much. (laughs) That's so funny. So what you're, um, you know, we're going to talk about simplifying and natural living and things like that, but you're you were a, a marriage and family therapist, right? Uh, for as a master's, or you have a master's in that, right? So was that like intimidating for your husband to um, to marry a marriage and family therapist? Well, we got together our freshman year of college when we were teenagers. We were like seventeen, so he hopped on the train long before <laughs> I became the expert and has been sort of encourage me, encouraging me and nudging, de- nudging me down the path all along. So he has been definitely my biggest supporter. And I think since he, since he got involved long before the bulk of that experience and education and expertise, quote unquote, was acquired, I think that probably makes it easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that would happen. Actually, I met my husband when we were in college too. You're Ooh. a little older, just like I was... 20 and he was the rural 20. So <laughs> that's uh, that's a nice way to nice way to do it. So did you have kids young then? Cause you like met your husband when you were 17. I mean, it didn't feel young to us, but by today's standards, certainly I always knew that I wanted to be a mama. That was like a huge part of who I was and really felt called to that. So we got married, graduated from college and chose to have our first kid. So I think I was like 22 when our first was born and she is now 15, just got her driving permit. And then we went on to have two more kids as well. So my kids right now are 15 and 12 and eight. Ah, yes. I I can relate to that. Yeah. 22, you were like a baby in in (laughs) this, in today's world. Yeah. you were. Um, and what was you, you teach about, uh, you know, we talk about gentle parenting and things like that. And where I want to talk about that, but it, I always think it's so interesting to find out like, what was your own story? Like what, what were your own parents? How did they parent you? Were you, were you carrying on really positive seeds from them or were you reacting against, um, unskillful means that they had? That's such a good question. And, um, no, like my parents were not gentle parents. I had a pretty dysfunctional upbringing. Both of my parents have been married and divorced many, many times. Um, so I never really had the experience growing up of having like a a family that was stable and um, trustworthy and secure. And so all of this is new to me. The same token, I think, you know, from the therapeutic perspective, we often talk about people existing in polarities. So they either want to duplicate exactly how they were raised or they want to do the opposite as sort of a reaction to how they were raised. And I think we all kind of move through various, you know, you know, poles along the journey. But ultimately, I hope that we can get kind of beyond that and elevate to the point of parenting like from a place of intention where we can factor in our own upbringing and and pack w- along with us some of the pieces that we really did love like my mother was very was very gentle in like her nature in in her spirit she was very affectionate both of my parents told me they loved me all the time like there there were some 
good, of course, because nothing is all good or all bad. So it's, it's nice when we can take those and we can also learn from the things that didn't feel right to us or that didn't feel good to us or the things, even if, if things did feel good to you and did feel right to you, but you recognize that they're not what's best for your specific child, you know, because every human is different and their needs are different. So I really try to evolve kind of beyond that replicating what they're doing or doing the opposite of what they're doing to just sort of really choosing with intention the kind of mother that I want to be and the kind of life that I want to live as a family and the things that my children need from me. And that's a little bit different among each of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I I can relate to that a lot. My parents aren't, or are actually still together amazingly <laughs> sometimes, I think. <laughs> I love you, mom. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but there was, there were, uh, there was, when you speak about gentle parenting, as I discovered the, the truth and the research about how, um, un effect, in- ineffective it is to hit kids and mm-hmm. yell at kids it, by ways of punishment, I felt, um, and I felt really vindicated in a lot of ways, like that fear that I felt when my father was really angry. And I, I totally forgive him for that and understand mm-hmm. his rage. Um, but to to see that, like, not only did I not want to do that because it didn't, it was really not so fun to go through as a person, but mm-hmm. it's, it was also, it's also really ineffective was like this like oh this like vindication of like oh okay yeah and there's there it's it's not just me it's like there's there is a path here there is like an evolution right kind of like you were talking about like like we can be more intentional about it but did you find i mean and that's what i found what i found for myself is that i found i had these habit energies inside myself that were i didn't want to be there like i had that same anger in me like i could Mm -hmm. feel that in me did you discover like unwholesome seeds in you that you when when your kids pushed your buttons (laughs) oh absolutely i think that it's the this sort of ideal baking of who you are as a parent is when we can pull together the ingredients of like our, our intuition, um, like holding my baby feels good. You know, like that feels good for me. It feels good for my baby. We have these like intuitive behaviors and these, this gravity pulling us to parent in this certain way, right? That's like this evolutionary way of parenting. And then we also have all of this incredible research and science. And I would, you can even count experience in there that can validate or help to guide you along that path as well. Like you were talking about how physical punishment actually does the opposite of everything that you would hope to do um, in in guiding your children. Like we can sort of combine those two things together to at our compass as we're moving forward as parents. I definitely had to overcome a lot of seeds that had been planted in my childhood. And I've I really tried to take on that work by being brave and questioning everything. And also, I just, if if you just have to take it one thing at a time, ultimately, Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I think that a lot of people will come to me and they'll say like, you're such an amazing mom. Like I could never get that far. Yeah. And not to say... (laughs) arrogant or anything, but just when people, you know, do say that, I I always remind them, like, I, I had to just take it one step at a time, just like you. Like I, I had an interaction with my kid and I, and it felt like I, it felt sticky. It felt uncomfortable. Something about it didn't feel like the kind of mom I wanted to be. It didn't help to foster what I would hope to foster in my kids. And so I would have to just pause in that moment and kind of take a step back and notice what was happening. Like what's happening in me right now? What am I saying and doing? Like what are my behaviors right now? And what is this doing for my kid right now? What is this stirring up in, you know, in this kid and what's happening when I do that? And just if we can sort of pause like that mindfulness piece, right? And just non-judgmentally notice what's happening, what's happening in my body, what's happening outside my body, what's happening in my kid. That gives us that awareness piece that we can use to then one small step at a time, rewire those thoughts, rewire those feelings and change those behaviors. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, one, one step at a time. I completely agree with you. But and it takes us like it, you're right to use the word bravery to be brave because it is brave to question, right? To say to sit in this discomfort yes. of like, oh, I feel bad. Something feels bad right now. So let me pause in it. Like mm-hmm. that's generally what I guess what we don't want to do, right? We want to push those things away, and we want to hold on to what's comfortable and push away what's uncomfortable. So that, hence, there is the the challenge of um, taking these things and making them be your teachers rather than things you run away with, from. Well, and, and the ego can be a big challenge in that. And I don't even necessarily mean in terms of viewing ourselves as like good parents and having to push up against that, but also the weight of your own upbringing and your society and your different cultures. If something you're doing feels sticky, is feeling off, and yet you learned that way of being or parenting from your religious organization, from inside your church, for example, like to question that does require a lot of bravery. You know, maybe you've got it from your school that you have a lot of pride in. Maybe you've got it from your entire family system, which is really steeped in your culture. And so that word bravery, I feel like it's really important to, to, to call out and to recognize that when people change their parenting, it requires a lot of bravery. I mean, you really are changing your whole family tree. And so that, that one small step, it might seem like this is just a drop in the bucket. I have so much work to do, but that one small step is huge. It's like changing the course of a big ship, you know, just small changes can yield huge differences in the outcome. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. Attention parents who homeschool or want to homeschool. Are you overwhelmed with all of the work and responsibilities on your shoulders right now? And for the parents with kids in school, have you avoided the need to pull your student out of the public school system just because it seems too daunting to homeschool them just yourself? Well, Homeschool Magnet is for parents just like you. Homeschool Magnet supports homeschooling families by providing students with instruction from world-class credentialed teachers in remote classrooms with their peers. Parents choose the best teachers for each student based on values and teaching approach to ensure that every child is receiving exactly the education they desire. This puts you as the parent in full control of your child's education without the daily responsibilities of lesson planning, pre-learning, teaching, tutoring, and grading. Each student will receive instruction on the four core subject areas of math, English, language arts, science, and social studies. Parents ultimately have the freedom to involve their student in as much or as little learning as they prefer based on each student's learning goals. Other online schools exist, but Homeschool Magnet is unique. Even though Homeschool Magnet includes a robust online learning environment, each student works from a real physical learning materials guided by video instruction from their teachers. This approach is similar to most remote college learning formats and will help prepare students for secondary school. Each student has daily access to their teachers who know their learning needs and can help with instruction and tutoring. Homeschool Magnet even gives your students the opportunity to enjoy tutoring calls and homeroom style group video calls for fun and socialization with friends. With Homeschool Magnet, you get the freedom and control of homeschooling without the burden. Homeschool Magnet is only a fraction of the cost of private schools and the 30 day money back guarantee upon enrollment means the choice is risk free. Plus, enrollment and tuition are on a per semester basis, so you're only committing for a short period of time, giving you even more flexibility to control and shape your child's education. To learn more about Homeschool Magnet's student experience, go to homeschoolmagnet.com and join the growing waitlist. That's homeschoolmagnet.com. So do you see that like there are a lot of people, I mean, I know there are a lot of people who believe in kind of a, there's the spare the rod, spoil the child, who really believe that and are really worried that um, if they don't punish their kids, they're going to have spoiled kids. That it's a real fear. It really comes from love to want to protect their kids from being spoiled. Therefore, they they have to kind of go this route. So I guess what I'm asking is like, do you see that in your life and what, how do you answer them? What do you tell them in in some of those moments? 
I think the most obvious or glaring example would be like a parent who hits their their child for hitting, you know, and, and that that template you can sort of spread to all of that spare the rod, spoil the child philosophy. Like if if your your kid yells at their sibling and then you yell at them for yelling, <laughs> you can see logically that that makes no sense at all whatsoever. So I think the research can be really helpful there in actually knowing what sorts of techniques and strategies and approaches yield the qualities that you hope to foster. So that's really like the starting point. The starting question is, what qualities do you hope to foster in your children? Is it compassion? Is it empathy? Is it bravery? Is it leadership, assertiveness, confidence, um, flexibility? You know, what qualities do you hope to foster? And then in this parenting action, in this moment, right now, today, is what you're doing fostering those qualities. So if what you're doing in this moment, the, the goal or the outcome is blind obedience to a person in a position of authority, then those are the qualities that you are fostering in them for the long haul. Is that really the kind of person that you want to foster? You know, I can see, I like that makes so much sense to me, obviously, but uh, to kind of take the devil's advocate here, I can mm -hmm. see that someone might say like, well, yeah, I want my kid to be assertive and confident and things like that, but I also want them to comply with me when I say, it's time to put on your shoes and we have to go out the door. Like, I... I I need compliance as well. So, well, well, I think I would argue what you need mm -hmm. in that moment is a partnership, not compliance. So, yeah. I don't want my kids to comply with people in positions of like blindless obedience. I, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I don't want, you know, we think about like how could something like the Holocaust have taken place? And I know that's a really big example, but that literally starts in is in these interactions and the way we treat children. If we want to live in a world where that isn't possible or that is less likely, we have to make those changes in this relationship right before you, between you and your child. So if I am trying to get out the door and I want my kid to put on their shoes, my goal would not be for obedience. My goal would be to, my intention would be to join with them and try and understand their perspective and figure out how I can meet their needs and how we can work together to accomplish shared goals for the day. It's someone from the outside might not even see it as looking tremendously different, but it feels tremendously different to the people who are involved in that interaction. It would be the difference you know, parenting is just a human relationship. It's just like mm -hmm. the relationship with you and your spouse. If I was trying to put my shoes on and my husband stepped in and said, if your shoes aren't on in five minutes, you're not eating dinner. Like that, <laughs> that would not feel good. <laughs> and it would not elicit any sort of good feelings or, you know, good human qualities in each of us individually and in our relationship together. Whereas if he came and he sat down beside me and he's like, looks like you're having a hard time. What's going on? What are you needing in this moment? How can I help? That, that would feel tremendously different. And here's the kicker. It would get us out the door faster yeah. than him telling me, if I don't put my shoes on in the next five minutes, I'm not getting dinner. Him joining with me and connecting with me and, and working together in partnership to get everybody's needs met, that is so much more effective. It takes less time, it takes less energy, and it helps you get out the door so much faster. Rachel, you are speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I feel like everything you're saying is like our words that came out of my mouth. But even the whole, like, the whole idea of like connecting the the micro to the macro. I mean, look at mm -hmm. our society now. Like, the, it's this authoritarian strongman thing that's in mm -hmm. the in the family that we also then have in the you know in the larger world politically and and et cetera. Like it's. Yeah. it's it's really fascinating and a real I think it really does start at home these these shifts and changes. Um, yes, you want to change the world. How are you going to talk to your kids today? How'd you talk to your kids this morning? That that's how you change the world. I think a lot of people are feeling a tremendous amount of anxiety, and part of that is a sense of powerlessness. There's so much hard stuff going on in the world right now, and they feel like there's not a whole lot they can do about it. There is a tremendous amount that you can do about it in your family, in your home, right now, in your relationships with the next generation. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes. 
seriously. Uh, so I, I love it. So, so you also teach uh, natural homeschooling. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is that and how is it different from traditional homeschooling? Yeah, I think when most people hear the word homeschooling, I mean, they're literally just projecting on the meaning of the word school at home. Um, and that's not our model at all. So we, I like the term natural homeschooling. Some people might say unschooling. Um, I like natural learning too. Basically, the homeschooling gives us the legal designation that we are taking ownership of our family's learning. The natural, in addition to like, yes, lots of connection with the natural world around us, it more speaks to the natural way that human brains have been wired and have evolved to learn over millions of years. So it's like an honoring of who your child is, like their given spirit, their natural way of being, and working with that um, to support everybody's learning. It's more of a lifestyle for the whole family than it is a a something that you do um, to a child. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I um, I'm a big um, advocate and locally in my community for um, ho- for um, Montessori schools and the mm. the follow the child approach and the the idea of these um, these intensive like learning periods where like you have a, a a window you have this child's window where they're just ready to learn reading right and they're just into it and then you have another learning window for another type of learning that you have and they're not <laughs> All, it's not that all kids at you know six or seven years old have that same reading learning window at the same exact time, right? Like so, it's it's yes. about kind of like taking advantage of these natural learning windows. It sounds like that's what you're doing in your home. Yeah, it's a lot of self-directed education. So, like once I have this class called the bucket system, which is sort of our soft structure, and part of it is that once each season, I sit down with my kids and I and we have a collaboration session around what do you want to learn, what's interesting you right now. What challenges do you need extra support for? What strengths do you want to nurture? Um, What are you curious about? What experiences do you want to have this season? And then I sort of adjust the environment and the materials and connect them with mentors and get them tools or sign them up for classes um, that are in service of those things that they are interested in. So that's kind of generally how it works. But also, I mean, it's good to point out that you can learn anything through the doorway or the window of an interest. So for example, I have one kid who's super passionate about sailing and he reads tons of like technical manuals about sailing. He reads nonfiction and historical books about sailing. We learn about the history of sailing. We visit museums about sailing. He participates in regattas and connects with all sorts of community and mentors through that. There's a ton of math, there's science, there's weather. Oh my goodness, weather. I've learned so much about wind. I didn't even know there was this much to (laughs) learn about wind. So any sort of interest that your kid has, that is like a doorway to get at all of the other things. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Did he watch that documentary about the teenage girl who sailed around the world by herself? Yeah. Oh my God, that was so good. I can't remember what it's called now. Maiden Voyage or Maiden. And then Maiden Voyage. Did he watch Maiden Voyage? We have watched all of the sailing things. About the yeah, the female, like, all-female team. Oh, it was so cool. My, yes. my daughter does, has sailed uh, a little bit. Um, so fun. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, we have a, a sailing <laughs> connection as well. That's so funny. I love that, that bucket system. I mean, that sounds like a great way to learn. It's so funny when I talk to um, people on the podcast who are, like, homeschool homeschoolers and you're so into it, I get all excited. And then I go and bring it to my kids, and they're like, no, mom actually, we want to go to school. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. That's great. Like, I just want to let you know it's an option that we could do this thing. And they're like, no, no, we want to go to school. We're good. We're like, okay, school. fine. <laughs> yes, I'm in support of what, I mean, and that's really part of self-directed education too. It's like, what do your kids want? You know, and what, in what sort of environment do they thrive? And yeah, the bucket system just sort of gives us that soft structure. And then we have like, a bucket with pins on it that help like in a really sensory way to with those executive functioning skills. So to help us follow through like our intentions and how we want to spend our time and energy throughout the day. 
Um, and you mentioned reading, and I'll speak to that really quickly too. The average age of reading is like four to 12, just because it's something that often gets asked about this like natural homeschooling path. Like, how will my kid learn how to read? I'll just say like, they'll learn to read the same way they learn to talk and the same way they learn to walk. Like nothing magical happens in the brain at five when they, they all of a sudden they learn differently. Like they learn the exact same ways they learn for the first four years of their lives. And actually talking is a part of literacy. Mm. So that's, you know, that's sort of all a part of the same path and the same trajectory. So like you said about each individual brain kind of being different and ready for things at different times and learning things at different times. One of my kids is a talker and she learns through talking. Like everything is talked out. That is definitely how that web of understanding gets all connected in her mind. And then I have a kid who learns with his body. He has to be moving and it has to be tactile. And that like we like play out the things that we're reading in the stories. Like that's what brings the learning to life for him. So you can really tailor it toward like who your kid is. And then, so there's that intuition piece, right? Like, like I was talking about before, like that, that knowing that evolution, that what are you drawn to? We have a sense of like how our kids learn and what they need. And then there's also that research piece and that knowledge factual based piece of that can validate, be really validating that like, oh, the natural window for literacy development is between four and 12. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really broad window. So your kid could learn it to, to read at any time in there and be considered completely normal. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. Gathering friends and family for Thanksgiving might be challenging this year, but it doesn't mean that we can't feel close. It has certainly been challenging for us. That's why, for me, I'm giving my loved ones the most meaningful gift this year, a chance to tell their story and share memories using StoryWorth. This is such a cool service. It is an online service that helps your loved ones share their stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. It's a fun new way to engage with family, especially those you can't see in person. Every week, StoryWorth emails your family member different story prompts, questions that you've never thought to ask, like how has your life turned out differently than you imagined it would? And have you pulled any great pranks, right? So they have all these amazing prompts and I can't wait to see how my grandfather responds to these. You get to read the weekly stories and it's fun and it makes your family feel close even if you're not together. I love hearing my grandfather's stories and I miss him and I would love to be able to hear about his life at this time to just feel connected, right? But the coolest thing is that after one year, StoryWorth will compile all your stories, including pictures, into a beautiful keepsake book that is shipped for free. And for me, I plan to keep this book and share it with my kids, my daughters, so they can understand more about their grandfather and also share it with my parents at holidays. What could be more meaningful, right? In a place where we have so much stuff, like to actually have something that you can hold in your hands. So give your loved ones the gift of spending time together wherever you live with StoryWorth. You can get started right away with no shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash hunter. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash hunter for $10 off. But I imagine it would be like incredibly nerve wracking. Like you might know that intellectually, but if you are the parent of a child who's like 11, and hasn't learned to read yet, you're probably freaking out inside nonetheless. <laughs> I think it depends. I think that if you are, if you're not really deep in a community of like natural homeschooling families, then it might feel that way. Like if all of your friends, their kids are in school, it's a really big deal that they force reading at a specific age because in the classroom, they have to be able to read to do everything else because it's a whole lot of passing out worksheets and you have to be able to read the instructions. Like the schools rely really heavily on that. But if that's not your community and that's not the culture that you exist in, um, then it's really not that big of a deal. If you're surrounded by people who are reading at different ages and different levels and you get to kind of tailor and customize your lifestyle to your kids' strengths and to learning everything and working on skills through those strengths, um, 
then it's really not that big of a deal. And I'll say we have, like I have three people in my family who have dyslexia. We have ADHD in my family. So this is, this is a lot of people might say, well, yeah, but that's not true of like neurodiversity. And I'd say like, absolutely not. Like this is even better for neurodiversity. My kids have no conception of like what, what it is to be behind. Like they don't even know that that really exists. Like everybody has their own time and we bring in any extra resources or help that any of them need that they're free to decline and they utilize all sorts of tools and they know really well how they learn. I think ultimately that's the goal for me is not to teach them what to learn, but that I want them to know how to learn. So anytime they have a need to understand something or they notice some sort of gap in their understanding, I want them to be completely brave and competent and confident that they can learn all of those things that they need. I love that. I mean, you have to learn how to learn and, and that's like, they, you know, they they do that very well also like in in the Montessori system but so well now you strike me as like this like I'm getting this picture of like sailing and like hiking and this very <laughs> open-minded like wonderful crunchy lifestyle what happens like how are your kids able to um what do, how do you approach things like video games and online learning and all of those things like are your kids playing among us and minecraft and watching youtubers like what yes. <laughs> there's this misconception that like nature and technology are mutually exclusive and i would say that i i completely disagree with that i don't see them as mutually exclusive i i think they are they are both a part of our lives like right now you and i are utilizing technology to have this conversation and to bring this conversation to a lot of people that might really benefit from hearing it so i think technology is a tool and, and we use it as such. And it can be part of, you know, like having an ice cream playing among us. You know, it, can, it can be a part of a really enriching lifestyle for sure. So we're not anti-technology. My husband actually has a master's degree in video game design and works oh, in the industry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it also provides for, directly provides for our lifestyle and the kids know that. So if we were to try to villainize it, it would obviously be completely insincere because it's how my husband makes is living. So technology and video games are a part of it. One thing that I try to help families with if they're feeling concern is to get curious about what your child is getting from the technology use that they're really into right now. Um, a lot of kids right now, what they're getting is socialization because of the pandemic. They're not getting to connect with other kids in the real world. So they're getting that through the video games, particularly things like Discord or Among Us or Fortnite. You know, it's like a social endeavor that they're engaging in on that platform. So if you are hoping to dial that down before you start pulling back, think about what you can add in to help meet those needs in other ways. Like maybe you can dedicate some time and effort and energy and creativity to fleshing out your bubble you know, like your pod of homeschooling families that you can get together with. Um, if your kid is getting from it that like they struggle with social skills in the real world, so friendships can be really tricky. And in the online world, they don't experience, experience that same friction and challenge, then maybe there's some things you can add in to help them with those social skills. Um, and then, you know, so we just, I want parents to think about like adding other things in to help meet that need before they would start pulling back. And then I would also say it's really helpful to front load your, front load your day with the things that speak to your values most and the things that feel most important to you. So the bucket system is how we do that. Like we hold space for things that are really important, like, um, being outside, being physical, reading something. I mean, it's different for each kid and it's different in each season. Like we collaborate around what things they want to hold intentions for, but I feel less concerned about them playing among us. Um, if they have al first already spent time like working on this project or learning more about this thing or working together or being outside. So just, I think front loading those priorities can be really helpful too. Yeah, uh, that's how I feel. And and sometimes that works out really well in, in a way that I feel like we're sharing our values. And sometimes it feels a little transactional, like go outside for two hours and then you can have your screen time kind of thing. And that's when it doesn't mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. as good, of course. Yeah. Um, I think the collaboration piece is really important in yeah. our family. So where we sit down together 
And it, it really is a true collaboration. It's like a partnership. They have a legitimate say in what they want to dedicate their time and energy to. And my point is that I just want you to be intentional about it. So this is our chance to get really intentional about it. And then sure, the daily bucket will like help to hold you accountable to that. But when kids get they legitimately get a seat at the table and they get to have a say in what they're learning, what they're practicing, what skills they want to develop at what things they want to let go. You know, each season we're, we're, Oh, that I'm over that. I learned, I got everything I wanted out of that. Like I'm ready to let go of that. And that includes like the hard, more hardcore subjects too. Like my kids will, one of my kids right now is just all in with reading. He really wants to like accelerate his reading progress. There are some pretty advanced books that he wants to be able to read on his own. So he could like just read them all day if he wants. <laughs> and so like a, a lot of the other things are not on the bucket right now. So he can fully focus on that. Um, so I think that coll collaboration piece can help to remove that transactional feeling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there has to be more of that, that conversation. Uh, you've ex mentioned the bucket many times. I'm, I'm not getting a like, clear picture about what this is and how it works. I'm a little confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once each season we get together and have that collaboration session where we talk about what they want to learn and what things they want to hold space for on a, on a daily basis, then each person has a little bucket with clothespins on it. And those clothespins are the things that, that we need to hold space for, that they want to hold space for. Um, so like, for example, the dog has to, what my eight-year-old has dog food and water on his, the dog has to get food and water, you know? So that's something that somebody has, has to take care of each day. And in this season, that's one of the things that he wanted to do. Um, each person has like a house pin on their bucket. And then we have a big house bucket that has all the things that we together have decided we want to get done in the house so that it is at the state that we want it. And truly not all from me, like in collaboration, we came and sit down at the table and said, okay, so pretend nothing has gotten done in the house. Nobody does anything. What things would we want done? Like what would be a problem first? And let's make pins around that. So it's just this sort of soft structure system that we use to run our day. But it, so, <laughs> I just keep mentioning it because I was just helping my kid with it before I came down here. <laughs> okay. So you have a bucket with like uh, clothespins on the edge <laughs> and on the clothespin is written something like feed and water the dog or uh, I don't know, like do your do reading work or whatever it is mm -hmm. you want to do right and does the day start out with the pins on the outside of the bucket and then you drop them in when you're yeah. done okay all right it's I just so, need to, uh, <laughs> it, it's so gratifying from a sensory perspective <laughs> like to have the, the sound of the pin hitting the bucket even so it's it's really great for kids and the adults do it too so like I don't have a physical bucket though I do recommend one when families start out with this, I think it's great for the parent to have one too. But I do engage in the same collaboration session. My kids get a say in the stuff. They see me holding myself accountable. I front load the things that are most important. You know, there, it's really, it's a family lifestyle. So we're all being intentional about this stuff. This sounds very, very Montessori. The whole like yeah. cl clothespins <laughs> yes. and buckets. It's like screaming Montessori. I, I, this is neat. I might, I might try it. This is cool. So <laughs> Um, you also advocate simple living. And so, you know, most, there's so many reasons for this. Maybe we could just, you could just talk about a, a, some of the reasons why this, why this is valuable to you to, to simplify to, is it, is it less stuff? Is it less stuff to do? Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. Now that I am wearing masks almost all the time anywhere I'm outside of the house, I have personally decided that comfort and softness is one of my top priorities for wearing masks. We have to wear them and Braddock, they do things differently and they are the most comfortable face masks that my family and I wear. I want you to listen closely because you're going to be able to get 25% off their masks when you use my promo code. So what I like about Braddock face masks is that unlike other masks, they actually do really feel good to wear. And they do this by using premium upcycled fabrics. They are soft and breathable 
and they have moisture wicking technology. They're super easy to wash. They don't come out all wrinkled when you're done washing them. They hold up after dozens and dozens of washes and they come in bunches. So you can get a whole bunch of them at once, right? You heard me use the word upcycled and upcycled means that it's a brand new existing fabric that they repurpose for their masks, reducing waste and materials. Less waste equals less harm to the environment. Plus, for every purchase using the code, the guys at Braddock are donating masks to those in need. Not only can you get the most comfortable, softest face mask, but you get to donate masks to those in need. Braddock has already donated thousands of masks to nurses and healthcare workers and first responders across the country. When you go check out your website, braddockusa.com, you'll see that they already have great prices, but for a limited time, you're going to get an additional 25% off with the promo code HUNTER on your first purchase. That's 25% off your entire order for a limited time with the promo code HUNTER at braddockusa.com. B-R-A-D-D-O-C-K-U-S-A dot com. 25% off your entire order for a limited time at braddockusa.com. Go check them out and get some. And from all of us, let's beat this and move on to better days. Yes. All, all the of, things. <laughs> all yeah. the above. I, there are basically like three spokes to my work. There's like the gentle parenting, there's the natural homeschooling and the simple living. And people often wonder like, like, why is that so important? Like, where does that come from? It plays into everything. It's simplifying the environment. Kids really absorb their environment and reflect it back as behavior. Um, so if your kid is dumping toys or even just the level of stress, levels of anxiety, levels of depression, overwhelm, the environment plays a huge, massive role in that. So the environment is a big one. I, I use the environment. That's probably the most active part of my homeschooling really are the things that I plant in the environment for the kids. So I release my attachment to whether or not they choose to engage in something I set up for them or how they choose to engage in it. But that active part is me setting these things up. Um, and it's not just stuff though. Like you said, it's, it's, it's time, it's money. Like I actually talk quite a lot about money because like I live in the real world and realistically to live this kind of lifestyle that I advocate for money, it's obviously a part of it. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's time, it's mental clutter, it's relationships, obligations always come up as a big part of it. The pandemic has helped a lot with that, but typically we waste a tremendous amount of time and energy doing things that we feel obligated or pressured to do. When kids feel rushed and stressed and your life is all transitions, it's a really miserable life, particularly I find for like full-time moms. I mean, if your existence is really rele relegated to transitions, like getting your kids places to and from, getting them ready for this, getting them ready for that, getting out the door, that sucks. Like that's not an enjoyable yeah. life. <laughs> so like we can clear all of that life clutter out of the way and then just say, like, what's your dream life? Like perfect day. Like say you fell asleep, a miracle occurred. You didn't know it occurred. You woke up the next morning. What was the first thing you would see or hear or feel that would let you know that that miracle occurred? And we can like walk through that whole day together. And then you can bring that, that, that dream life. You can make that your life. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Step by step. And it's mm -hmm. about like when you have a, a choice point, mm -hmm. the cho when you have a vision of where you're going, then you, you know how to make a choice when you have this yep. different points of inflection. That's cool. So, um, so what are some things that, uh, what are, you know, for somebody who wants to s simplify their home, you know, how do you decide how, what are some, some, what's some advice you have for things that stay or things that go? Yeah, I said it's, it's helpful to start with the simpler spaces first. So for example, like the bathroom, like your bathroom is a really great, it's my favorite place to start when working with families, with moms especially. And I, most people would say start by like getting rid of things. I actually say to start on the, in the other direction with intention. So like before you even go into the bathroom, make a, like, imagine, close your eyes. We do a full visualization, walk through like your ideal morning. 
like in the bathroom? What are you doing? What objects are you touching? What like tools do you need to make that ideal morning happen? And then that's like your list. And we just get rid of everything else <laughs> and then put those materials like where they're easily accessible. And you can do that kind of for everything, like your environment, these objects, they should be, they, sh they should be existing in service mm -hmm. of this lifestyle and these relationships that you want to cultivate. Yes. I like that. The objects should be existing in service. I know we have a, we have a house that is on a slab and so we have no uh, basement and we have no attic and we have a, <laughs> we have like a four under, on the, for under the first sort of like landing of our stairs, we have like a, a, I don't know, a three and a half foot tall, like four foot long space. <laughs> That's like our entire storage space for like the whole family. And it makes me so happy because, yes. because I cannot keep the like snowman Shotsky mugs that are given to me. I say, thank you very much. And they go right out the door because <laughs> I can't keep that stuff around the house. And I'm yes. so grateful all the time. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yes. It feels so good to have all of those nooks and crannies just be, even just holding open space. Like people, that is vastly underrated. We, we feel this compulsion to like fill in all the spaces and we all need open space for that, for that stuff we want to hold space for to flourish, particularly with kids. They need space to build a massive fort. They need room for, you know, it's like, I want, I wish my kids moved their bodies more, but then if you look in your house, like there's no space for that to happen. You know, you tell them, no, they're not allowed to throw the couch cushions on the floor. No, they're not allowed to pull the dining chairs into the living, you know, then, then they can't do that. So you've got to like use the environment and simplification can be a huge, huge, huge part of that. And the research, like we talked about, there's that intuition piece, also that research piece. Research shows that it, it makes a massive difference in the emotional, psychological, educational, physical well-being of all humans, but especially children who are even a little bit more sensitive to the environment. That includes time, schedule, calendar, bank account, house, when things are simpler. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a huge, it just takes a lot of that stress away. But then I guess people, you know, we get like, oh, the stress of simplifying, of getting to that point is like a barrier, I assume, you know? Just like with this parenting stuff, it's just one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Um, so for somebody who says, oh yes, like I want, I want my life to be simpler. I want to have more excess you know, I want my kids to have more time in the natural world. What are, what are some simple places to start? So start maybe in the bathroom. I, I, I don't know. Where else do you say people should start? Schedule, like absolutely your calendar. And again, the pandemic has helped a ton with this, but I, the calendar is, I would say like the number one most powerful point of simplification. Um, a lot of people, like I'll ask them what their values are and they'll tell me all these beautiful, wonderful things. And I'll say, great, show me your monthly calendar. And like, that's not at all reflected in their calendar. Their calendar is full of busyness and, you know, their kids signed up for seven different things and it's go, go, go. And there's so-and-so's birthday party. And, so, and, and like, and then their values are like, quiet time together as a family in nature. And it's like, that's like once in, in the entire month's calendar. So your calendar should be a reflection of your values, like full stop. Like that is make that your calendar hold the space for the things that are most important to you. So if time together in nature is most important to you, that needs to be a recurring event in your calendar. And that gets put in the calendar first before anything else. So if someone says, hey, here's the invitation to so-and-so's birthday party. Oh, that's family nature day. Sorry, we're busy that day. We can't attend. Like hold space for those values. Mm. I, I like that. I appreciate that. I, I don't know. I would, uh, if I had a good friend who had a birthday, I might say like, <laughs> let's go for a walk in the park and go to the birthday. You know, like there's ways to figure that out. But I, I like that. Like we should have these things in the calendar. We, you know, we go on a, 
plenty of like hikes and things under my family, but we don't have them in the calendar. Although my older daughter is in scouts. She's a scouts BSA, um, a mm-hmm. girl scout in the boy scouts. She's a scout who's a girl in the boy scouts. Anyway, oh, I love that. Um, which is amazing. And for everyone who has girls who are 11 and up, this is such a like, it's, I can't even tell you what an incredible organization it is. Like it's had some issues from things that were happened 40 years ago, but it is such an incredible organization as far as teaching these like skills and, and they go camping. She's been going camping like two times a month, two nice. weekends a month during the pandemic. She's going backpacking and camping <laughs> and like in the rain and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just like, it, it, it's funny because I started, I took her backpacking before scouts and I thought I was going to have like a backpacking buddy. I was pretty psyched for that to happen, but now it's all scouts. So now I have to <laughs> knock on the scouts door and say, can I come along on one of these backpacking trips? Um, nice. Well, and that's a great example too. Like if backpacking together is your higher value, then to load that in first. And then if there's a conflict, like you have your priorities stacked and in order. And with your example earlier about the birthday party, like if if that type of social connection is a value for you, like that can be in the calendar, but just get really clear on like the hierarchy for you and the amount for you. Like how often would it feel ideal for you and your daughter to go backpacking together? Like maybe once a season. Okay. Then put that in the calendar once a season and that can help hold you accountable. So then if something else wants to come on the calendar, that day is sacred. Think of it like church, Mm -hmm. right? Like people tend to be like, they tend to have no problem. Like, no, Sunday from 11 to 12, like that's church. Doesn't matter whose birthday party it is. It doesn't matter what, you know, Aunt Susan, Aaron, Aaron, she wants you to run on that day. That day is booked for a church, of course. Do that with your other values too. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. The only problem is I think that she would... I would put it in a higher priority to <laughs> go with her and she would put it in a higher priority to go with her friends at this point. So I don't know. I might be lo- fighting a losing battle in this one. <laughs> Gotta be in partnership for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, it's interesting thinking about, you know, you've created this way of life that is seemingly pretty ideal, right? Like where you get to spend time with your kids, you get to teach about, simplifying, which holds you accountable for <laughs> simplifying and, and being gentle and, and, and the natural homeschooling and all of those things. Um, you know, I guess I'm wondering kind of what are you, sort of the, your, what kind of words, what have we missed that the listener might want to hear? And when thinking about, you know, maybe not quite being in that place and, and wanting some, a taste of some of those things and, you know, what might be sort of your final words of advice, I suppose, for this moment for that person? Mm. I would be trust. Like if I were to like give a homework assignment to help shift things in the direction of this lifestyle, it would be to look for one opportunity in your day today to lean into trust. And when you first start to do that, it feels scary and uncomfortable, particularly if you are accustomed to leaning so far forward that you're, you're the manager and you're taking up all of the space. You know, when you do that, if you lean far forward, your kid has to lean back. Mm-hmm. And then that confirms for you that they can't be trusted and that the things you've been doing can't be, what the things that you feel called to do can't be trusted because they don't work. And so you lean forward even more and you control even more anxiety leads you to control and you sort of get stuck in the cycle. But you can just one time, just one moment today when you feel that urge to like lean in and take over and, and to not trust your kid, just pause and lean back and just observe what happens. Um, that, that like moment can be so powerful because in that moment when you are brave enough to lean back and just trust in your kid, it's, you're going to be so rewarded. It's the most incredibly rewarding feeling. And every time, like trust grows exponentially. So every time you can get even just the slightest bit of trust, 
that, that you can get connected with and really feel between you and your kid, it just, that grows exponentially. Cause then the next day it's like, Oh, I remember how that felt. And I remember how my kid like really rose to the occasion and, and everything was fine. And then it felt like I had all this additional relational capital to get us through the rest of the day. Like he felt like honored and trusted and, and that really paid it for it. So then the next day, like you do it even more. And the next day you do it even more. And it, it's just trust that that would be, that would be my one thing is to, to look for an opportunity to lean into the trust today. I love that. What a beautiful thing to leave us with. That's really beautiful. <laughs> so Rachel, where can people find out more about you and what you're doing? Yes, rachelrainbolt.com is the hub for all of my fun stuff. I have my Sage homeschooling book on there. I have my whole book series and then all my classes like the bucket system. And then I do coaching as well. And then I'm pretty active over on Instagram at sage.family. So if you follow me over there and comment on my stuff, I can get to know you and we can be friends. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Now I want to like go on a hike with you and then like <laughs> plan a like sailing excursion. Out yes. of well, we'll have to start by you coming <laughs> on my Sage Family podcast so we have another excuse to talk. That sounds great. All right. So stay tuned for, for that one. And <laughs> thank you so much. Can you tell that Rachel's like my new online BFF? <laughs> we, uh, we really enjoyed talking to each other. And I love what she, just that reiteration about how kids absorb their environment and reflect it back in behavior, how, you know, environment can really modify behavior. And it's interesting as we go into the holiday season to think about that, right? As we get more and more stuff. So something to think about and that that intention to join with our child, right? That's totally what we need, this intention to join with our child. It makes a huge difference. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. We'll be back next week, of course, with another amazing conversation. I would love to see where you're listening, what your takeaways are. Take a screenshot of the device you're listening on and tag me. On Instagram, I'm at Mindful Mama Mentor. And you can also see the behind the scenes of my life there. I'd love to hear what your takeaways are from this episode. It, it's so, so, so valuable to me when it's uh, a two-way conversation. And so if you haven't ever done that, this episode, this is the time you're going to do it. Make a promise to me now. I want to I wanna hear your takeaways are, dear listener. And I'm, of course, I'm wishing you a great week. I'll just a quick reminder that if you're interested in the Mindful Parenting Teacher Training, the deadline is December 18th, and you can learn more about that at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash teach, mindfulparentingcourse.com slash teach. I hope that you are safe and well and I hope that you are taking the time for practices that steady your heart, right? Our hearts need steadying during this time. And my heart needs steadying during this time. It's not easy. It's not easy for any of us. And there's so much suffering. So please, when you do practice peace in yourself, you practice peace for all of us. It really makes a difference. So please do some practices to steady your heart. And I'm wishing you well, wishing you peace. And I will be back in your ears again next week. Thank you so much for listening. Namaste. I say definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them and not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I have this you can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? 
Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You'll be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. This isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list, so you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside mindfulparentingcourse.com.